Well, this morning's message is the nativity. And, um, and we're going to read Luke chapter 2 and also Matthew chapter 2. And as we look at the nativity, it is, again, it is something that um, all of us are familiar with. You know, you see the nativity around. Um, we have it right here in the uh, church in the back. We have it over on the windows. We have it there on the um, piano. We have this nativity scene that is before us. So we're going to talk a little bit about that this morning. But let's read Luke chapter, no, excuse me, Luke chapter 2, verse 2, excuse me, verse 1. And we're going to read it through, and this is the Christmas story as we know it. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David. So he taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. One of the things that we learned in uh, the Sunday school lesson today is that when, prior to this, um, we have the angel announcing to Mary that she's going to conceive and have a son. And when Joseph learns of this, Joseph then is deciding that he should put Mary away privately. Now we know that Mary and Joseph were betrothed. Now, that is not an engagement. It is, it is the same as a marriage, except they don't live together and they've had no sexual relations. So we find that for Joseph to um, break the, well, he considers Mary to have broken their betrothal because she's having a child, and so he's considering putting her away privately. That means he is going to divorce her legally. So he, uh, rather than doing this, when the angel comes to him and tells him that he doesn't need to worry about taking, receiving Mary to be his wife, he finds out that it w this was by God that the Holy Spirit came upon Mary and she uh, conceived of the Holy Spirit. And so Joseph then does not put Mary away, but he goes through with the betrothal and the marriage. And what that means is that Joseph then was the um, adopted parent of Jesus. That he took on the, you know, if he had divorced her, he was separating himself from Mary and the shame that went with the idea that Mary had committed adultery. But when he finds out that she didn't commit adultery, Joseph then finds out that, you know, he, you know, he's going to, oh, I, you know, he's going to go through with the marriage. And so rather than um, separating himself from Mary and taking the shame, excuse me, um, walking away from the marriage, walking away from the shame, he then accepts her and he goes through this with her and, and he becomes um, the father, the adopted father of Jesus. Well, what that means is that Joseph, who is of a house in the lineage of David, that D Jesus adopted becomes of the house and lineage of David, just as it was prophesied in the Old Testament, but Mary also was of the house and lineage of David. So it puts all this together and, uh, you know, comes to, um, I think, a greater understanding of what is going on here with, the, with the, uh, the text and the scriptures and also what we spoke about last week with Isaiah um, saying, you know, I'm going to get, God's going to give to the king, I'm going to give you a sign, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And this is the fulfillment of that. So um, one of the things that we have here is that Mary and, Mary, and, Mary and Joseph were in the wrong city, <laughs> okay? So you see, prophecy has to be fulfilled. Jesus is not to be born in Nazareth. Jesus is to be born in Bethlehem. And Mary and Joseph were, still in, were, were not in Bethlehem. 
And so how, do you get into, how are things going to be arranged to get them to Bethlehem in order for the prophecies to be fulfilled? Well, the king, um, the, but he was, uh, while Cyrenius was governor in Syria, he wants to take a tax. <laughs> he wants to know everybody to go to their cities, their hometowns, and register and, um, so that they can be taxed and drafted into the military. So Mary and Joseph then have to leave where they're at and head to Bethlehem, but she is great with child. So that's how we have this, this story unfolding. Um, so they go there to be taxed with Mary, verse 5, his espoused wife being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto us is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even to Bethlehem, and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made it known unto the saying which was told unto them concerning the child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, as it was told unto them. And then in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. So when we look at the nativity, um, we're going to look at a, just a couple of things that surround the nativity this morning. But all of us, we've seen the nativity, whether it's on the windowsill or behind me, we, we're familiar with seeing the nativity, whether it's uh, in church lawns or in the community, we have it in the park here in Wimber, but it's put there by the United Churches. And then we see it in Christmas cards and other things. And um, they're, they're everywhere um, this time of year. Those cutouts seem to be very, very popular. And um, they, they are in many places. I, we saw one the other day that they had it away from the house and had a spotlight on it. And the whole side of the house was the, the shadow of the manger. It was, it was quite, quite unique. Um, so, uh, you know, it was, that was the most unique one that we've seen. Um, so we've all seen the nativity throughout our, throughout our lives. And as a kid, we, I, we participated in a live nativity. Um, so there's a live nativity in Davidsville, one of the churches. So as we look at this, let's, uh, we're going to open up or spend some time looking at a couple of the scenes around the nativity. And, and in particular, we're going to look at the star uh, first. So the star that God provided as a guide to the travelers. The Bible tells us that God commissioned a particular star to serve as a kind of travel guide. <laughs> now, we, you know, our scientists have gone back, you know, they can take the um, solar system back and, you know, judging where it's, where it's at, 
where it's been and they keep rotating it around. They can, they can take it back to the time that Jesus was born and they're, they're saying, well, perhaps the, the alignment of a couple of stars beside each other becomes the, the star of Bethlehem. Well, we know that these wise men from the east followed the star and they followed it so precisely that it led them to Jerusalem, led them to Bethlehem, and led them to the very house where Mary and uh, Joseph and Jesus were. The, the um, wise men didn't show up at the manger. <laughs> you know, uh, we kind of have that scene going on. We put them all together. But the wise men didn't show up for some time afterwards. Probably Jesus was less than a year or just more than a year old when the wise men came. So Matthew 2, 9 tells us that they saw the star and it led the wise men to the exact location. So this star was just, in, in, and I look at it as not just alignment of two planets making a big star. This, this star was such that it was able to give a particular direction to the right house <laughs> where Jesus was, uh, was a toddler. And so scripture clearly states that the wise men rejoiced over the fact that God had provided a remarkable, accurate travel guide. And that's kind of the emphasis here. A remarkable, accurate travel guide. Now, they never would have found Christ without the star. They would have never known that a um, king had been born if they hadn't seen the star. And so we can look at the star as a symbol of the fact that God has always provided a travel guide <laughs> to those who earnestly seek him. Whenever we seek God, he promises us that we will find him. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. And so we find in this text here that God has always provided a travel guide. God has seen to it that those who seek him find him. So all of us, who have come to know Christ as our Savior can look at a time when we were just getting started, starting to be interested in spiritual realities, and remember perhaps how lost we felt whenever it came to knowing Christ as our Savior. God provided a travel guide. <laughs> he provided a travel guide for us to lead us to Christ. It might have been a parent, a mom and a dad, a pastor, a person at work, a neighbor, a brother, a sister, a teacher, past, you know, whatever. Without that person, I doubt that we would have ever come to this place of knowledge and acceptance of Christ. God sent someone to cross our path. And those are the things I, I look at in life, knowing that people come across our path for a purpose. And in this spiritual manner, that God brings people into our life to enrich our spiritual lives. So God sent someone across our path. He sent someone whose light was bright. Someone whose love was real, whose faith was so compelling, we found ourselves trusting in this earthbound star, this earthbound travel guide to lead us to Christ. And this is kind of a reminder that we, too, are stars we are people who shine the light of Jesus Christ uh, for other people to follow. That we have a purpose. So as we look at the star in, in the um, scene, we can not only see how God used that to lead the wise men, but we also see how that we are that type of light to the people who are lost and searching for Christ. Where would some of our lives be had we not found Christ as our Savior? So Christmas is an appropriate time to thank God for the gifts of a travel guide. <laughs> so we can give thanks to God for giving us someone to guide us on our path. Perhaps you feel that you're more like someone who is still searching. <laughs> you have not found Christ, but you're someone who is not found yet. Are you spiritually detached? Are you looking into the new year thinking that you're there's nothing good going to happen or come because Christ is not there. Well, chances are God has already put a travel guide in your life. And, you know, I think of this for when we're looking at and thinking of people who are 
they don't know Christ, or they have not given their life to Christ. They're not part of a, a church or not part of a fellowship or the body of Christ. And that they're lost and they need a light in their life to guide them to Christ and bring them to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So if those individuals scan the horizon, I'm sure that they can find that there's a star in their family or in their friends and their relationships. There's a star out there that is shining for them to come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. More, uh, <laughs> it's like the one guy said, um, I don't want my wife or my, my husband or my kids to bring me to God. Give me a celestial travel guide. <laughs> they want, I want a miracle to come into my life and show me the way. <laughs> well, we find that, um, I always like that little cartoon, the people, the guys praying, God, give me a sign, God, give me a sign, you know. And then this huge billboard falls out of heaven and crashes to earth. And on the billboard it says, here's your sign. <laughs> you know, <laughs> here's your sign. You got to want a sign, here's a sign. Well, God has already given us a sign. It is his birth, it is his life, it is the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. So let God determine the best way to lead you to him. The wise men would probably have preferred a more personalized kind of guidance <laughs> rather than having to look at the star. And, you know, the stars, you know, if you don't know, it's only visible at night. You know, so. I had one, one guy once, he said, you mean to tell me the stars are out during the day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The sun's too bright, you can't see them. Oh, I just thought they came out at night. Oh, everybody has something, you know. But let God determine who's going to be your guide. So the point is that the wise men were responsive to the guide that they had, the star. So they responded to what was there. They looked at what they saw, and they were able to be smart enough to interpret it. You know, you think about it, the whole world that was at that time could have seen that star, but nobody knew what it was. They didn't understand it. But the wise men, they understood that there was a divine purpose in such a uh, magnificent star. So people then come with their questions. <laughs> why don't the numbers about life and all things, why don't they add up? Why does it all seem pointless you know, look at our society and look at all the things that's going on. It just seems like we're all headed downhill. Well, life will add up only whenever we place Christ in the equation. Jesus must be in the equation of our life in order for things to add up. The key to spiritual progress is to seek out this person who is grounded in their faith, grounded in their spiritual life, and allow God to use them to be the light to bring us to this relationship with Christ or bring us to the place where we belong or find ourselves part of the body of Christ. As a seeker, you are challenged to do the same kind of thing during the Christmas season. We are called to look to the guide. You know, oh, we don't, Christmas is nothing but commercialization. Yeah, but I want you to know that Christmas is about Christ. And so the, we need to bring up a conversation about Jesus. You know, and, you know, people have all these, I, I, you know, I get frustrated sometimes with people. Did you ever get frustrated with people? They ask this, the most stupid questions. You know, why, you know where, did, where did Cain get his wife? You know, Cain killed Abel. That's why I don't believe. Like, you know, Get a life. <laughs> you know, why don't you learn a little bit before you, you know, sometimes, well, I won't get caught up in stupid people. But anyhow, that we look at things and, and, and people say, what well, doesn't add up? Well, this is, this is, Christmas is about this and Christmas is about that. And what is Christmas is really about is the birth of Jesus Christ. And you see, God has probably given you a star 
He's probably given you someone to lead your life and guide you to Christ. You just haven't paid attention. That's the star. Second, we're going to refocus a little bit from the star to the stable. The stable. Well, the stable itself, uh, when, I was in, when I was in Bethlehem, you, you know, there's a church. Every, every site has a, um, every religious site has a church over it. Okay, the stable in Bethlehem was probably a cave, well, the, where they have the church at. There's a, it's, it's not like a cave. I think, you know, when you think of a cave, you think of an opening and you walk into the opening. Well, this uh, in Bethlehem is an, an outcrop of rocks. And underneath the rocks, it goes back in maybe 10, 15 feet and down. And so there's like a shelter over what is back in, uh, back in the rocks. And if you take that and you put a few boards on the other side uh, uh, where the rocks stick out, you can have a pretty good uh, stable where the animals are underneath the rock and the, the, the stable itself could be built out to house more animals. And so I can assure you that the stable that Jesus was born in was anything but a quaint little attractive bassinet. <laughs> He wasn't, he wasn't, um, it was a, it was a stable. And it was crowded with animals because there was no room in the end. So that meant everybody was there and most of them didn't walk. They rode something or many of them walked, but uh, they rode some type of an animal, a donkey, a horse or whatever. And those were all in this stable. So the place is crowded. And they didn't have, they had, well, the, talks about, not in the scripture, but you know that a lot of mice and rats and stuff would be in the stables. So it was an all-around rotten place for a baby to be born. Which makes us ask the question, if God can command, this is one of those questions, if God can command a star in the heaven, why can't he have a room at the Hilton? <laughs> you know, why is it he can't have more expressively a room in the inn? Why wasn't there a reservation for, wasn't, why, why, wasn't, why did the um, innkeeper not know enough to hold a room for someone who's coming later tonight? <laughs> and no. You see, it was an act of God. He could have deliberately caused that to happen where he would have, Jesus would have been born in, in the inn or in a room in the inn. But you see, there was no room in the inn. Similar to our humanity, there's no room in the hearts of people. And so there was no room in the inn. So God chose a stable for his son to be born in. When God sent his only son to live on this earth, he made a strategic decision not to shelter him from the harsh realities of life. Jesus wasn't born in a palace. He was born in a barn. He wasn't born in a make-believe life of the rich and famous. He was born in a barn, and he was laid in a manger. God wanted his son to experience a loving family, but it was a poor, hard-working family. And you may not, I never thought of it this way. The first breath of Jesus was filled with the stink, stank, stunk of a barn. <laughs> Did you ever, you know, a barn doesn't smell good. <laughs> the King of Kings and Lord of Lords is born in a barn and his first breath is the breath of a stable, a breath of manure and livestock. The first sounds he would have heard were cattle or horses or donkeys or sheep or whatever. Those are the first sounds that would have been in his ear. The, are these the sounds of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? Is this the place where you would imagine God could be, be, God could be born? <laughs> From day one, God the Father determined not to shelter his son 
from this cruel world, the realities of a life. Why, you may ask, what was the purpose? Well, can the insulation of wealth relate to what you and I go through? Can the insulation of privilege and a high position relate to what you and I live? Because those lifestyles of the rich and famous, they don't live where we live, and they don't eat what we eat, and they don't drive what we drive. <laughs> so we take a good look at the stable, and the stable is a permanent symbol of the fact God sent Jesus to live in a real world. It was for our sake Jesus was not given an aristocratic advantage. He had humble beginnings. Those beginnings were something that none of us can relate to. He lived in a neighborhood. He worked a real job. He had real friends. He suffered hardship like the rest of us. He died a cruel death for a crime that he didn't commit. So when the Bible tells us and urges people to give their life to Christ and that to go through their disappointments and turn them over to Jesus, to turn over the pains of their hearts and the difficulties that they have encountered, they can be assured that Jesus knows exactly what they feel. He can know exactly what people go through. He's been there. Life without advantage, he's been there. Shortages and poverty, he's been there. Discrimination and oppression. <laughs> Jesus was a refuge before he was, ever, before he was one year old when Herod was going to kill all the babies in, Be in Bethlehem. And so Jesus had to flee for his life. His mother and father took him to Egypt. Rejection, he experienced it. Ridicule, <laughs> it was a part of his daily life. Abandonment, his lifelong friends left him at his greatest hour of need. Physical pain, he had more than you and I combined will ever experience. Has some experience in your life driven you to within an inch of giving up? Well, we can go on because there is someone who understands. It is Jesus. Remember, to him, you matter more than you can possibly imagine. That's why he came and did and put up with and went through all of these things. Can you see how important the stable is? It symbolizes the deliberate, unsheltered life of Jesus. It stands as a monument to his ability to identify and sympathize with whatever we are going through. We must be humble and trusting enough to pour out our hearts to him and then allow him to love and administer his love to us. For we find that our, our, our faith is based on a relationship and Jesus came to build that relationship. And finally, that doesn't mean I'm done, but it's getting close to the end, almost. So we've looked at the star and we've looked at the stable and now we go to ground zero, the manger. Well, we find that the manger is not a first century bassinet. <laughs> the manger is a feed trough and most people wouldn't even know what the word manger means unless it was attached to this particular story. So we look at the manger, it is a symbol of what can happen to the ordinary man or woman when Jesus Christ resides inside. For the manger that was an ordinary feed trough now has been elevated to a symbol of God coming to be with us. You know, the ordinary, this manger, the ordinary manger becomes extraordinary because of the one who is laid in the manger. And the, cha and the challenge is for us who we appear to be ordinary, but we become extraordinary when Christ resides in our life. These ordinary people came to realize that they couldn't change their past. People come to the point where they recognize they can't change their past and that they're, if they're going to change, it will have to be a drastic one that is brought about by someone who is an outside help. <laughs> that is Jesus. 
But when people fell on their knees, we think of the wise men coming to Jesus, bearing their gifts, and they fell to their knees. Well, we look at that in our own life as that we repent and we turn to God. They fall on their knees to cry out for grace and mercy and to ask for forgiveness and to recognize that Christ has purchased their salvation. Their records were wiped clean by the blood of Jesus Christ. You see, we have been adopted. Adopted when Jesus uh, stayed with Mary, when Joseph stayed with Mary, he adopted. And the scripture talks about how that we are adopted into the family of God. We are joint heirs with Christ. And so we find this place of relationship that we have with God. Ordinary people who came to a place and said, God, forgive me. Allow Jesus to take up residence in their life. Jesus, just as he was laid in a feed trough, king of kings, where a cradle became his place of rest. When a person was a people pleaser and their life is changed by becoming a person who desires to please God. You see, God does to each one of us what Jesus did to the manger. He makes something that was ordinary, extraordinary. So when we look at the manger and we look at the star and we look at the stable, wherever you go at Christmas time, you're going to see the nativity scene. When you pass, take a look. Look at the star that God provided as a travel guide for the wise men. We are a shining star for people who are searching. Look at the stable. Don't forget that God decided not to shelter his son. We think of it, oh, this is the shelter for Jesus when he was born. But the idea is Jesus decided not to shelter his son and brought him into the realities of difficult life. A stable is a place for animals, <laughs> but it was a place where the king of kings was born so that none of us could ever feel that he couldn't reach into our life. And as we look at the manger, manger an ordinary piece of barn furniture transferred into the king's cradle. You know, your choice is simple. You can just be there and watch another nativity scene go by or you can stop in your mind and look and say, wow, there was a star that guided the wise men. There was a stable in which the king of kings was born in that God would not shelter him from the realities of life. And there was a manger where the King of Kings and Lord of Lords was laid. And he was <laughs> wrapped in swaddling clothes. Those are so nice terms. Uh, swaddling clothes is rags, strips of rags, strips of cloth that they found laying around the barn. That's what the King of Kings was laid in. Strips of rags. That became his clothing. So as we look at the nativity, let us look and see how God has brought us to a point where we can see how much God loved us that he would go through all of this just to be our Savior. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that <laughs> these are not just stories. These are the truths of your word that give to us the reality of the King of kings and Lord of lords who has come to be our Savior, our friend. We pray that we, might, that we might draw closer to you and recognize that you understand us better than we understand ourselves. You're not better than us. You are one with us. And we thank you for this. We ask your blessing upon your word to our hearts and lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. And Merry Christmas. Not yet, but Merry Christmas. <laughs>